to a brand new episode of our Danny Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfa Mensa. And if this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, I welcome you and I hope that you return for future episodes, especially after you listen to this one. This one's going to be special, y'all. And if you are a returning listener or viewer of the podcast, as always, I welcome you back. And I hope that today's episode is one that you find informative, enlightening, and of course, insightful. So before we get into our main event for today, to my people who are on YouTube, please make sure you hit that red subscribe button so you can get future notifications on new episodes of the podcast. If you're listening from Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anywhere else where you listen to your podcast, make sure you subscribe there as well. And for those who have been asking about how they can help contribute to the growth of this platform, uh, you can submit donations to two spaces. One is Cash App using the handle dollar sign ID talk for Ed. And the other is Venmo with the handle at Kwame SM. That's K W A M E S M. And to catch past episodes of the podcast, especially for someone who has never watched this podcast before, you can go to our main website at identitytalkforeducators.com, or you can just go to our YouTube channel to catch up. Thank you, as always, and we appreciate the support. So uh, today's episode, for me, is one that is very special. Uh, for those who have been on this journey with me since uh, December 2019, you know that this podcast has evolved in more ways than one. Um, I can remember coming into this space, not even knowing what a podcast is, uh, not knowing how to edit, not knowing how to do all these different things that I'm doing right now. And in order for me to get to where I am today, as far as being able to facilitate conversations and being able to, to moderate uh, conversations with different guests, I had to study the game. I had to watch people who are doing it. I had to watch people who are hosting different educators and interviewing them. That's how I was able to grow. And uh, today's guests are two people who I really had to study because they just had a different vibe to how they do their podcast. And they're one of the first people who I really paid attention to as far as figuring out, okay, if you want to run a quality podcast, this is the way you do it. And they have been able to lay out a blueprint, not just for myself, but I'm sure for many other um, educators who really want to be in this space and amplify their voice. So it's an absolute honor to have them on. And uh, without further ado, I want to bring on two middle school teachers coming from the six, Toronto, Canada. Let's welcome Shay Cheney and Pav Wander, better known as Shay and Pav, your award-winning podcasters from the six. And we're going to get this conversation started. Let's do it, y'all. What's going on? Hi, Kwame. How are you? Thank you for that amazing introduction. And also, I'm just going to throw in there, your pronunciation of Toronto is spot on. <laughs> yes, Kwame, indeed. Thank you for the invite Appreciate to it. Identity Talk. We're looking forward to the conversation and, and so humbling how you gift that praise to us. And you're right, as podcasters, you've got to study other people in the space. And there's that era of reciprocity. A podcaster doesn't do something to keep it in. It's I'm experimenting as I podcast, and I hope you pick on a few of the things we're doing, doing it a little better, and then we just keep re-gifting this because the, the podcast community needs to be united because as an audience, you know, not everyone dives into the podcast space. So when you can bring people into podcasts, no one only listens to one podcast. People listen to one podcast, and they go two, three, four, five, and then they become a podcast listener. So let's get this go on. Uh, I'm loving the energy. I'm loving the energy. Uh, <laughs> but as I mentioned before, um, I create you. Appreciate y'all coming to the space. Um, everything that I mentioned is just truly the heart. Like you all really set the bar high in terms of how you all produce your podcast, the presentation, all the attention to detail. And 
you know, you really are inspiring a lot of people to really get into the space, um, including myself. So, so thank you for that. Really, thank you. We really appreciate that, Kwame. That's um, it's really nice to hear. Uh, you know, we we probably started just a, a little while before you did. Uh, you were mentioning December yeah. 2019, and uh, that's that's we were very early in our podcast journey as well. And as you were talking about your journey, I was thinking to myself, "Wow, it mirrors a lot of our journey." Um, just not knowing at all. Uh, how to begin this process and what to do and how to edit and the things that we've learned along the way are just, um, well, they, they feed into all the rest of the work that we are doing as well. So it's been a very important journey and, and I can hear it from, you know, when you speak as well, that it's been a very important journey for you as well. And, and we're so happy that um, not only are you able to share that with your listener community, but we've also had the privilege of being able to do that as well. So the reach has been um, pretty incredible and we're super grateful for, for all of it. And we'll certainly get into the benefits that podcasting has brought onto ourselves, our overall practice and just life in general. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna point out the fact that we all teach the best level of school ever is middle school. Hands Nothing down. beats middle school. Uh, <laughs> when I was in the classroom, I was a middle school math teacher. I taught grades six, seven, and eight. Best years ever. Nothing compares to it. So to have some fellow middle school teachers um, in the space uh, is always rewarding and, and always great. There's certainly a different adrenaline rush when people say, what do you love about middle school? Every day is different and every day is a, just a welcoming adrenaline rush. And even on your worst days, they're still impactful days and they keep you coming back. So, yes, there is a synergy amongst middle school teachers. So looking forward to that part of the conversation today. Yeah, for sure. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning, like we always do on this podcast. So the first question I'd like to ask my guest is, who or what inspired each of you to want to become educators? So we'll do ladies first. Uh, Pat, we'll let you start. Yeah, you don't even have to tell me that. Uh, <laughs> between Che and Pav, Pav always goes first. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, teaching was not something that, you know, I, I, would, I didn't grow up as a student and, uh, you know, as a young person thinking to myself, I'm going to be a teacher when I grow up. Um, it really wasn't part of my career path. Um, and so as I was entering the workforce, I, I worked for a pharmaceutical company um, and I, I was in the new employee learning and development part of the company. And I just remember having new employees come in and it was my job to sort of deliver some initial training to new employees. And Although I love that part of the job, what I loved even more was being able to make those connections with people as they learn something new. And that was a very rewarding process to me. And I was very young. I was just entering the workforce and I was thinking to myself, you know, I love this part of the job. I love when people learn something and that person and I are able to make a connection over what they have just acquired, this new knowledge, this new information. Um, I loved watching those light bulbs turn on and, and it wasn't like incredible work that we were doing. These are just employees that are learning some new procedural things, but that, that part of the job was so rewarding to me. And I, and I had a coworker who actually was a former teacher. And uh, I remember having conversations with him going, you know, this job is like, okay, but the part that I love the most is when I'm teaching. And he said, well, why don't you become a teacher? Like, if that's the part that you really, really love, and that's the part that you're really connecting um, with, why don't you go ahead and, and do that? So I, I, I quit and I went to teacher's college and I completed my certification. And from there, it's just been an incredible learning journey for myself as well. As I as I learn new pedagogies and apply them to my teaching practice, work with incredible kids, work with teachers in this uh, sort of learning and development within education, it's been the most rewarding journey for me. I, I 
for a hundred percent appreciate this journey for what I originally fell in love with. And that's making those connections with people who are learning. Um, and that acquisition of new knowledge, that retention, that application of knowledge, uh, it's just such a rewarding process to see. Uh, and, and it lights up my world, you know, as a teacher. And that's the reason that we keep doing it, because I love to see the reward process of, of getting something new in my in your head. And so that that for me is what did it. And that's what's kept me in that space as well. Um, and it's why I, I continue to want to grow my own knowledge base when it comes to being a teacher. So that was the inspiration for me. Um, and, and it's been just growing ever since. That's a good How answer. You, Pav. You, well, Pav said something wrong there. And because she said when I used uh, to be young, <laughs> used to be young, I heard that I heard that, you know, that's a lie. <laughs> Uh, Cause you're young right now, uh, but everything else was so good that I just want to say the same, but that wouldn't make any sense. But I learned that trick from my middle schoolers all the time. Same thing, Mr. Cheney, same thing. But my journey to education, similar to Pav, wasn't, wasn't where I was thinking I was going to go. As you can tell by my baseball hat, I, of course, like every 14 year old boy thought he was going to play major league baseball. Uh, but when I got to university and could only bat 189, I realized that dream was done. Um, but the baseball and the athleticism led me into coaching. And so I did my coaching in my comfort space. But from coaching, then I went to my local community center and I started to do after to, after school programs and March break programs. And then I got hired to do summer camps. And then that ended up being six or seven years of my life. And I still had no thoughts I was going to be a teacher. But someone in my organization was watching what I was doing and said, you have an amazing skill set. You connect with youth. You inspire youth. We got to get you more than just here in our community center. As much as we would love to keep you, there's more for you. And so my story into teaching isn't so much about what I did. It's about what someone around me saw in me. And someone sort of didn't sort of put their, their organization first. They saw talent and they saw something that could be impacted. And so they sort of mentored me to get into teacher's college and go from there. And so my journey into teaching is one of being gifted, someone seeing something in me and saying they were going to advocate for me and guide me through the process and the applications because I had no idea where I was going. And I ended up teaching. So my story is not really about what I did. It's about what other people saw in me. And I think in the back of me that always sits there really reach out to see other see things in other people and guide them somewhere oh uh, for sure and with you two and you've probably gotten this question many times but for those who may not be familiar with the two of you how did you all cross paths um that's a that's a great story because trey and i we we started teaching together i want to say about six years ago seven years ago um, but uh, Che and I didn't ever cross paths with one another. Uh, I was teaching sixth grade. Uh, che has been teaching eighth grade for some time. Um, and, and our paths never really crossed. But one year I was teaching um, grade eight. And, uh, and so we were teaching kind of like, you know, we were team teaching uh, in the same division. And so it was a little bit easier for us to collaborate on projects. And I just was very much like, Oh, you know, I, I like your style of teaching. It's very similar to mine. It's a little off the, the beaten path. It's it's not as, you know, traditional as I, I see. I, I definitely can learn something from this teacher. And that always gravitates me towards another. Um, if, they're, if they're doing something that I feel like I can learn from, um, I, I just want to, you know, I want to know more about that person. So Che and I started working together as as teachers, um, we got to know each other in that way. And uh, the podcast story kind of, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, brought us even closer together. And so that that started that started this team, essentially, but uh, but the the, the our origin story is not very glamorous. It was just, you know, two teachers that were working together and, and me having sort of this, uh, this kind of in, inquiry process of like, I, I want to know more about what that teacher has to offer. And, uh, and, and I'd love to learn from Che, is your story any different? Ooh. Well, I can add a specific anecdote. Cause you're right. Just, but it's also like in the bigger theme, like teaching is really a silo because even teachers four doors down or two floors down, like the chances to interact are not guaranteed. 
And so you don't make assumptions just because you're teaching in the same building. You're going to have these wonderful connections with everyone. There's got to be a little purpose to it. But I do know that we went to a workshop together when we still didn't know each other. And you know what? Despite sort of people assuming my personality is big, whether that's true or not, we can debate. But I'm not necessarily really great at interpersonal uh, communication. I think I'm much better at sort of taking the not that I'm a sage on stage, but that idea of performance. But when I'm not performing, sometimes I'm very stoic, Pav. I know you love that word, but I'm very quiet. And so what I know that when people come when relationships form and, and you get to know someone, um, I know that for me, those are important. Similar to you, Pat, there's a curiosity. Like, I want to get to know you. I want to invest energy in this. But I do know we went to a coding workshop together as our school, and there was like 10 of us. And I remember listening to you talking about the workshop that said, hmm, there's something here that's more than just reading the six steps of how to um, use coding in your classroom and just saying, that these are the six steps I'm going to use. I just need to repeat it. I could see that you were a, a thinker and that you love the pieces that were being shared in this PD, but you just wanted them as little pieces and then you wanted to, to build something yourself. So very similar, I said, there's someone I want to get to meet and I want to get to know because I know good things are going to happen. Pav, you can tell me I'm lying or we can just send it right back to Kwame. <laughs> Hey, um, Jay, I don't know about the whole stoic part. Just from what I see, you just seem like the ultimate extrovert. But I will say this. Usually, I come alive when I'm talking with people. Or if I'm around my students, I feel more extroverted when I'm in their presence. But if I'm in a solitude of my home and it's just me, I can be more of an introvert. So I can see how we all have different sides of who we are. So I could attest to that. I just want to add that for sure. And so... You all finally crossed paths, but actually, before I even get to that part, I, I want to go back to your schooling. So when you're going through uh, K through 12, and on this podcast, we always love to talk about identity, like how people end up figuring out who they are and some of the obstacles, if any, they had to go through to get to that place. So I'm wondering from each of you, when you're going through your schooling, were there any struggles that you all had in terms of trying to embrace who you were authentically and show up as that true self in those different spaces you were in outside of school? Jay, you want to start with this one? So that, those aren't the rules. Those aren't the rules. You always like to go first. But I'll dive into this one, identity. And I, I guess I'll, I'll tie Che the student uh, to Che the teacher. And so... Um, Maybe I'll start with where I am. So why do I think I, I'm an, a successful teacher? Now, someone can debate that all they want. But let's just say generally, I'm a good teacher, always pushing to be great. But overall, in the 25 years, pretty successful. Where do I try to figure out where my success has been? And I think my success has been is that I struggled at school and didn't really fit in at school. And so as a teacher, I've always felt that those type the type of student that doesn't really connect with their school or maybe feels alienated by their school or is perhaps shy or embarrassed about what they're what they're able to do or not able to do or what they perceive they're able to do or not able to do has been the student I've been able to connect with the most authentically because that's sort of my experience through education. So back to as a student. So I spent grade three to six sitting in a behavior room, I spent grade seven in a behavior room. You know, I guess we don't use that terminology now, but that's how it was explained to me back then. And that's how I understood it. And then I went to high school and I struggled a little bit and I failed a bunch of courses and I didn't have anywhere near enough credits to, to graduate. So I needed to, to take them in night school. And so my experience in high school in regards to like forming my identity, I think I was so, and, and I'll just internalize it, whether it's right or wrong, it's just how I felt. But I felt like I was I was embarrassed by how little I knew, how little I understood. I could walk into an English class and I was like on edge all the time, anxiety on a massive level, because I was so embarrassed by my perceived level of knowledge that I couldn't engage in the school community. So I didn't engage as much in extracurricular. I didn't engage in classroom discussion. I didn't make like great connections with teachers. I was always perceive my embarrassment. And that would probably come from being in very small classrooms from grade three to eight. I think grade eight was my first mainstream classroom. And so my identity through high school was always high anxiety, highly embarrassed. And, and so I never really connected with my school and I never really connected closely with anyone through school because those anxieties, that would be in hindsight, how, was my identity through high school. Just embarrassed 
by what I perceived my lack of knowledge was. And I wouldn't engage. I wouldn't take the risk or I didn't feel I could take a risk because I didn't want to be in that spotlight. And when it comes back to teaching, I think that's why as a teacher, those type of students, I think I see that right away or I can anticipate that. And so that idea of putting students in positions to fail is something I, I am just naturally able to alleviate. And then the flip of that coin, Pav, and you know, we've had this conversation is sometimes I feel I don't connect as well with the really strong student because I don't know what it's like to go into school and just get it. And so as a teacher, when you think about the student that's maybe is whipped through your lesson, they, they seem unengaged, but the thought that they haven't learned, they've got it. They've got it figured out. For me, it's, it's a tough access point to a conversation because I can't relate to that. I can relate to, I can sort of perceive the student that's maybe not engaging because they don't feel safe enough to engage because they've got these anxieties about what people may be saying. That typically has been a space where I feel that that's where I'm my best. And so when I think of how does that identity play in my my role in school, and again, this is only how I felt it was going on. Whether that's really what happened, I don't know. But that's how I felt about my school experience. And I think that's how it's uh, formed me as a teacher. So my identity right there. Pav, see, you tricked me. You tricked me by making me go first. But I know you're going to crush it going second. <laughs> uh, I, I asked Love you to go teamwork. first. <laughs> that's what we do. That's what we do. I wanted to hear that story from you, Che, because it, it's it's very similar to mine. Um, I love, I love not similar, you know, anecdotally, it's not the same, but the, the idea that our identity informs who we are as teachers. I think that's, that's very similar to the theme that I have as well. Um, so I love, I love this identity question, Kwame. It's, it's so important as educators to look back at who we were as students, who we were as children, our upbringing, um, and, and take a look at how that informs our practice because it's, it's foundational. Um, very similarly to Che, I also, you know, look at the way that I was brought up and myself as a student uh, and, and how much of that plays into who I am as a teacher. Um, I grew up incredibly shy, incredibly quiet. I'm a Punjabi Sikh girl who was um, the child of uh, immigrant parents first generation Canadian, um, very much of my upbringing in the 80s and the 90s was about uh, assimilation and finding ways to assimilate with my Canadian, my Canadian counterparts. And so um, a lot of it was just watching, watching what other people are doing, how they're living their lives. And I and I grew up in a very diverse community. Um, many cultures were represented in the area that I grew up in. It's actually the same area where Che and I currently teach. Um, so I've been so blessed to see it evolve over the years since I was a student and, you know, how it's different and what, what's happened to the community. But, you know, I grew up with a bunch of other first generation Canadian children who were doing very much the same thing, assimilating, assimilating to the culture around them. Uh, and that's just the way it was uh, in the 80s and the 90s and during my formative years. Um, and I've watched the community evolve now to a space where that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so much of our own identities, our own cultures are being affirmed through education, which is a new experience for, for myself even. Uh, so that has been such a beautiful thing to watch because it's not something that I grew up with. So seeing representation in the learning materials that we're using or seeing representation through, um, you know, the, the guest speakers or, you know, human resources that we have in the classroom is such a blessing and it's such a gift. And I don't ever take that for granted because perhaps my trajectory would have been a little bit different if I had seen that representation as a student. Uh, and so it's, for me, it's how much of that can I provide to the students that I have in front of me, the diverse community that I have in front of me? How can I help teachers who perhaps didn't have the same upbringing as me to, to sort of want to provide that for their students as well? How much can I, can I help my colleagues to also bring that to the classroom? Because I think that it would have, uh, or affirmed different parts of my identity when I was growing up so that I could be stronger with that um, as an adult. And, and I think that that's, that's a piece that 
I lacked when I was growing up and, but it still informs who I am as a teacher because I recognized that it was missing. Uh, and so, and I, and I recognize that my students probably need more of that because I wish that I had it. So for me, that, that was a part of my identity that, um, that I, I draw from a lot from, from my youth and, and into my practice as a teacher. And I love how you started to segue into student voice path because a lot of what we do with podcasting is all about amplifying diverse voices that we bring onto the space. And we'll get more into that. But I would like to talk to you all about how podcasting came into your life. I know in my case, I got into podcasting uh, because I needed a refuge from everything that I was going through. I had just moved abroad. Uh, with my family. I was in Ethiopia at that time. I wasn't able to find a job at the international schools that were there. And I started to get depressed because I had gone 13 consecutive years knowing that from September to June, I'll be in a school with a group of students. So to do that for 13 consecutive years and then go into a space where now you're not lesson planning, you're not having to reach out to parents about the upcoming school year. You're not interacting with students. You're just in this idle space trying to figure out what to do. And uh, when I got to that space, I realized I have consumed so much of my identity into this teacher space. Like everything about me was all about teaching and I had abandoned all the other parts about who I am. So podcasting came at a time where I needed to tap into those other modalities that I had as a human being. And really, I wanted to create my own classroom and invite educators to talk about what they do. Because if I couldn't be in a classroom in a physical building, I was going to bring the classroom into my space and, and make it a space where educators belong and they can just share stories and be vulnerable. So that's just, in a nutshell, what got me into it. I'm wondering if you all had a uh, similar sentiments uh, when you all caught that podcasting bug. I love that story, Kwame. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm, and I love hearing about different journeys into podcasting. Um, ours was a little bit different. Um, we didn't have, we didn't really have that sort of longing to create content um, and, and enter this, this space. Um, Che and I were introduced to this because of a friend of mine who I went to school with, and it's and it's funny to bring it back to um, bring it back to my youth. But um, I had a friend who reached out. He and I went to middle school together, and uh, he knew that I was still teaching in the same community that we went to school in. And he said, "Hey, I really want to give back to the community. I want to do something for the community, but I just don't know what to do." Um, he's a real estate agent, and uh, he had started a podcast. Um, of his own. And I knew about this podcast, I was seeing it on social media. And you know, this is someone who I've not talked to very much since we were in school together. But you know, just like social media does, you you stay in contact with people just kind of from afar watching what they're doing. And, um, and I knew he had a podcast. And I said, Hey, would you like to teach stu the students how to podcast? And he was like, that's a great idea. So um, so I connected with Che. This was the first project that Che and I worked on together. Uh, I was currently, I was not, although I was in middle school, I was doing rotary science. So I was not, I didn't have my own class. And I said, well, I, I need a group of students that we can do this with. So I went to Che and I said, I know that this is very similar to the style of teaching that you have. I know you love content creation. Um, your students would love this. And I know that you'd be open to trying this. Would you like this? this project. And, and Che said, this actually ties in beautifully with the genius hour that we're doing in class already. This would be a fantastic culmination to that. So I called my friend, uh, he brought in his whole production team because he had, a, he, he knew what he was doing. <laughs> and we were just like, wow, we, we have no clue. Um, he had a graphic designer, he had a producer, he had a full studio set up. Um, he had all kinds of stuff um, for his podcast. He brought the whole team to the school, taught the students how to how to develop a podcast episode, and then he brought the entire class to his studio to record the podcast. And Che and I are just taking notes while this is all going on. Wow! Oh, that's what you do. That's what you're supposed to do. Okay. 
this sounds great. We're loving the process. Uh, we sat down with uh, with Jazz, who is the host of his of the podcast, to to do a little ten minute segment for for his show about this process, and it ended up becoming a forty five minute episode on its own. We just sat and we talked with the host about this podcasting journey, this process, and what it did for the class and how much they had learned. Um, we absolutely fell in love with this idea of just sitting and and discussing teaching and the process and these these hallway conversations that teachers always have. Uh, and we loved that reflection process. And so for us, we our podcasting journey began because of what we saw happening with the students that we were. We just loved this this whole journey. This content creation it was exciting. It was new. It was a way for us to document our own conversation with one another um, that we were always having anyway. It's just why not record them and put them out into the world for people to people to listen to. Um, so so that's a little bit of our origin story, Che. I know I've probably missed something there. Would you like to add a, a little bit of your own flavor to to the story or anything, any anecdotes or any stories that I might have missed along the way? Yes, please. I was just going to say, no, there's not, nothing I can add. You stole okay. my thunder. This is <laughs> ruined for me now. I, I'm, yes. You're lucky I'm still in the chat. I'm surprised you didn't remove me from the chat, Pav. I know the way you operate. Um, you that That is... That is their project. You had those connections and that community connection. I happen to have a class doing Genius Hour, and that's how it forged. And then it's like it's like you stumble upon something and you find it just so intoxicating and so vigorous. And so when we did that 10 minute, the supposed 10 minute intro, it was 45 minutes, and we said we need to do this again. And then I do remember one anecdote was then going back to Jazz and Laura and having lunch with them and then just picking their brains and picking their minds and trying to figure out. Now, of course, we could never get to the level they were at in regards to all the production pieces, but we had that lunch and then we just went. And at first we thought we would do one a month. And it, during the COVID times when there was nothing else that we could really do, we were recording almost three a week. And I said, remember, our plan was one a month when we started. But Kwame, you know, once you get on the mic and once you get in those conversations, it, you just you're thriving on, on, on that conversation and you so anticipate the next one. So that's all I can add on, Pav, to your level A, level four plus 100 percent answer. So this season. I Dance Talk for Educators Live will be including ad spots for businesses, products, and events that are adding significant value to their communities. And here's the catch. You don't have to be an educator or an education-based business to be a part of this. We're looking for people who are just doing great work in the community, and we want to use our platform as a way to amplify their work. So if you are an entrepreneur or you know of an entrepreneur who is doing just that, Bring them in our direction. Have them reach out to us. If they want to learn more about their ad spots and how they can get themselves promoted on this platform, they can contact myself, Kwame, at Kwame at IdandyTalkForEducators.com. I'll say it one more time. It is Kwame at IdandyTalkForEducators.com. Hope to hear from you. And let's keep on amplifying our work and building each other up. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and i think when i look at my experience it was kind of backwards because i was already out of the classroom um at the time that i started so initially i wasn't thinking about how the podcast would benefit students i was thinking more along the lines of how the podcast can benefit teachers and foster more collaboration between teachers especially during a time of COVID where you couldn't go anywhere, everybody's social distancing, everybody's staying in their house. Your only refuge was a computer screen, circle light, and a mic. That was the refuge for me. So I want to talk more about that part because one of the things I've realized about podcasting is how it's become like a social networking tool. I've met so many phenomenal educators from all across the globe. And I've been able to acquire so much knowledge from each educator. You know, I feel like I'm a sponge every time somebody comes. There are things that you all have said that I'm now internalizing and thinking, oh, never considered that. I want to try this out the next time. So I'd love for you to just share 
if you view your podcast in a similar way where it's a space for uh, collaboration and even future collaborations uh, with some of the guests that you bring on. Okay, you want to start? Oh, I would love to start on this one, Pat. I was just waiting for you to throw that to me like a batting practice fastball, and I'll have a swing at it. Um, Kwame, you know, our podcast is probably, is it has to evolve. It has evolved. And so when we talked about our origins, our origins weren't so much to build an audience. We were just thinking we wanted to capture a really authentic um retake retell of our week so we just wanted to reflect on our week and we wanted to create an artifact that we could come back to and say five years and say this is where we were as teaching and we weren't really thinking about connections and we weren't really thinking about sharing our learning or we weren't really thinking about throughout the week planning for our episode everything was just reflective hey we recorded i think our first 35 episodes literally in the back of our classroom on friday night the bell would go we would set up and 15 minutes later we would record so if you want that truly authentic sort of uh, friday afternoon conversation that what it was but as we got excited about our podcast we wanted to become a little bit more purposeful in our content and so then we said okay on friday we want to talk about this let's make sure we're working on this throughout the week so we have something maybe a little bit more tangible so that maybe as our audience was growing they would have something they would they could take and use in the classroom themselves and so our concept really became these hallway conversations right. we are going to capture them and then we as we developed the episode wasn't supposedly to teach you something. The episode was just to spark a conversation. And that we really used, when you think about uh, our social media, we used our social media to expand the episode, to extend the learning, so that we really encourage people, hey, come chat with us on Twitter. What are you seeing? How do you interact with this content? Uh, and we would push some contents. We did one on toxic positivity or is it toxic productivity how does this look like in your actual building we talked one about learning skills and sort of demything the funk of who benefits from learning skills is there is it really equally measuring other student or does it perhaps simply further um if Kwame, you're already free you know what's going on how we use learning skills to elevate so I know. Just, just, they I are know. White, yeah and so we had a really conversation about that. We did one on growth mindset. We really challenged growth mindset on some of those same anti-racist frameworks. Who's really benefiting from the narrative of, oh, it's just growth mindset. Who's allowed to take chances and never, ever be punished? And who sits in classrooms and is always worried about, hey, every time I do something, I'm going to be punished disproportionately for it. And those talking points, we weren't telling people to change. We were just having those conversations. And it would generate a lot of conversation in social media spaces, emails, tweets, Instagram comments. And that sort of gave, I gave, I don't know, that community building, that space was building. And it gave Pav and I sort of, it sort of started to tell us what we were doing with our podcast. Like our audience said, this is what you're doing. And then as Pav and I sort of realized it, is that, those conversations were coming as people are saying you were taking sort of academic conversations and you were bringing it and making it practical because you would take this academia conversation when a when if you go to a lecturer and they talk about how growth mindset's unequitable but you also want to hear it from a teacher that can show you how this looks in a classroom and i think a lot of our i would call it praise was like you take academic conversations and you make it practical and you make it real because your conversations aren't about what you saw teaching 10 years ago. They're actually what you saw teaching six days ago. And that has relevance because a teacher knows that with even now, if you think about the COVID revolution that sparked the technology revolution, that has the AI revolution. If you haven't taught in 10 years, it's really tough to try to position yourself as a teacher. You were a teacher and you may have been really good at it, but teaching has evolved. And I think the, the power of our podcast is that it's really current. And that doesn't mean don't listen to any other podcast because we are just two teachers we only bring that middle school space so you need to couple us with you know the science of reading podcast you need to couple us with a top shimmer assessment podcast because those those become critical components Pav, how about i throw this over to you and then you correct all my mistakes but then just add how we just started to incorporate some of those interviews and sort of expanded from reflection to the sort of the hard edge content and then expanded our podcast to sort of build that community through through interviews because to our base interviews aren't the majority of our episodes the majority of our episodes are just pav and i having a conversation so people come for pav and i'm always a consequence of that and you have to listen to me uh, while while we're on pav to you or to you 
Thank you, Che. Um, and that was a perfect example, Kwame, of what collaboration looks like with co-hosts. <laughs> Um, Jay yes. threw yeah. me uh, the next segment and he told me exactly what I should talk about. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's very important. I, I do want to throw in um, that when it comes to collaboration, nothing will teach you more about how to work as a team than starting a, po co uh, starting a podcast with a colleague. Um, you learn all kinds of new ways on what communication means. Um, what it means to be a leader in even a small team of two. Uh, you learn about so many different aspects of collaboration. Uh, so that is probably the foundational collabor collaboration piece that, that I want to talk about. It's, it's the teamwork that Che and I have developed uh, working together. Now, we've been working together for five years uh, and on this podcast, and, and we are still a very strong partnership that, is, um, that we really balance our, our own personalities off of. And I think that that's, that's a little bit of collaboration that deserves a little bit of, a, of, of a applause, I think, because a, a lot of people don't realize how difficult it is to um, to partner with another person on developing a, a big piece like this, a big project. So beyond that, though, as as Che threw me the bone to talk about a few other things, the collaboration that we've been able to develop from the people that we've connected with uh, has probably been more impactful on my learning journey than any of the books that I read when I was in teacher's college. Um, because so much of the connections that you make with the people that you are learning from, your your brain is spinning as that person is talking to you. The, the conversation and the connection that you have with an expert in a particular, fee, uh, in a particular field will really um, do something to your brain mecha mechanisms to make it immediately more practical in your teaching. Uh, and it must be something to do with the conversation, or maybe it is an interpersonal connection that you make with that person when you are speaking to them. But I feel like I have been better at putting into practice the things that I have learned from our interviews and from our panel discussions than, than from any other paragraph or article or entire book that I read as a teacher. That's not to say that I didn't get anything of value from the books that I read um, or the written pieces, but the meaning has been so much deeper from these conversations that we have had. There's not a single conversation that Che and I have had with a, a guest where I didn't take something important and immediately put it into my practice, immediately. And I think that that is such an important thing that many people who are not podcasters are probably missing out on um, or, or maybe just don't have a good understanding of is that when you have a conversation with somebody, it, it develops this, this deep connection with that person or with the things that they have to say. So uh, that was very, very important for us in terms of our practice. Um, but Che and I also developed a couple of um, other projects along the way, namely our our book, Amplifying Our Practice, Teachers Talking Teaching, which I know we will talk about in a few minutes anyway. Uh, but many of the conversations that we had with, with our guests on the podcast or through those collaborations on social media that Chase spoke of uh, led to contributions to our chapters of this book. And uh, so many of those conversations that we had with people really you know, helped us see that we really need that voice. We really need that voice in our book because that highlights exactly what we are talking about. These are experts in the field that can really speak to the to the uh, academics behind the practice that we are putting into this book. Um, so Che and I can speak about our own lived experiences. We can talk about our own teaching experiences, um, but we may not necessarily have the expertise uh, academically to be able to back that up. But because of this journey, because of all the collaborating that we've been able to do, we know someone. We know someone that we have learned from, someone that we've already spoken to or somebody that we've had a desire to speak to about that field because of this entire process. And so we were able to tap into that expertise and, and knowledge and, and bring that into our writing project as well. So um, the podcast has not only deepened 
our need for collaboration, but it has also um, provided us with a window into additional learning and additional projects that just keep this process rolling um, from time and time again. And I want to add this. This podcast could also serve as an artifact for learning, professional learning. Now, I don't know if you all within your district have a, a teacher evaluation system where you have to submit artifacts as part of your um, evaluation. Whew. I just keep thinking to myself, if I had discovered podcasting when I was still in the classroom, this would be the artifact right here. I can show mm -hmm. images of my classroom. I could show anchor charts. I could show um, kids in action. Of course, if they get consent, you know, to have their mm -hmm. images shown, but I could still show them in action. And just like you said, you, you two have a dialogue about what you are doing in the classroom. I don't think there's a more complete artifact than a podcast that's able to encompass all of the practice you're doing, all the professional learning you're gaining, because you're coupling the dialogues you have with each other with the occasional guest interviews that you have. So I just wanted to add that part. But you did all mention uh, your new book, Amplifying Your Practice, which I believe is a phenomenal book, just the way you all were able to tap into so many different educators and allow them to just share uh, their story. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share the image of the book so that people can see what it looks like. So here's the cover for those who wanna take a look at it. It's very much Che and Pav written all over it. Just the sound waves, it, it, it's such your vibe. There you go. <laughs> Let them know. Right. Let them know. Let them know. I'd love for you all to just talk about just the process of writing the book. I would imagine that the process of writing was easier because of the fact that you had these archive of podcasts you could draw from. Uh, but y'all can correct me if I'm wrong about that. I, I have to start by saying, Kwame, there's nothing easy about writing. There's <laughs> nothing easy. And well, I don't I'm writing know, the book like, right now. Trust image. me. <laughs> <laughs> From that image there, you can't quite see the thickness of this book. But but this is 250 pages of sweat and tears. Um, and, and there were a lot of tears over, over the, the writing process of this book. But it was a process that we absolutely loved. Um, and, and I have to say that uh, the podcast definitely helped us in many ways to be able to write this book. Because, well, one, um, we wouldn't have been approached by the publishing company to write the book if it wasn't for the pod. And um, for those people who already have picked up a copy of the book, thank you so much. We appreciate that unbelievably. But every chapter is actually mimicked from a, a podcast episode. So um, there are interviews, actual interviews, transcripts of the interviews that are intertwined within every chapter um, from the contributors that we have put into this, this conversation. So you're not hearing secondhand what these experts have to say about any particular topic. You're hearing the primary evidence. You're hearing this information directly from those contributors because we had vocal interviews um, about these topics with these uh, with these contributors uh, and so that that transcript is embedded right into the chat um, so that you can hear exactly what that contributor had to say so it's very it almost mimics what a podcast episode would be like and Che and I have intertwined that inform that uh, that primary knowledge that firsthand information with our anecdotes uh, from in the classroom. So this is, you know, these are the things that the experts have to say about this particular topic. And this is what it looks like in practice in a middle school class. So we've, uh, we've added our own anecdotes and our own research and our own information to sort of encapsulate that dialogue that happens within the chapter. And, uh, and there's 10 incredible contributors that provide information about some of the, the most important topics that Che and I have experienced in the middle school classroom since the beginning of our teaching career. So it, it really does uh, add a lot of that, that value that we have gained from the podcast, although it's, 
it didn't make the writing process any easier, but it did def it did give us a foundation that we could draw from uh, as sort of the vision of this book. Che, what do you want to add to that? Uh, I, I, oh, well, you have you put it all so brilliantly. I, it, it's tough to the podcast like. Like you said, Pat, without the podcast, we wouldn't have been gifted this space. So as a whole, sometimes when you see what's your value of your podcast, it's not necessarily the podcast itself. It's about amplifying your story, creating a wealth of resources, and people notice. And even sometimes if you think no one notices or you think you know who notices, you'll always be surprised as who's watching your talent. So by elevating your story, it just provides a lot of these opportunities. And so through the book, it's sort of, I think by podcasting, we sort of knew afterwards where we needed to go a little deeper. And despite wanting to break hierarchies of literacy, I think we all know that people dive into the written space a little bit more comfortably or schools will invest like our principles, you know, that this is credibility. Our podcast, I could probably argue it's probably deeper conversations, but the credibility associated because it's oral content seems to be lacking. Yet we we work in a in a in a system that claims to want to be debunking this myth of, of literacy and not having this hierarchy of literacy. But to our core, we always value the written component. Uh, and so Kwame, when you're talking about your evaluation piece, you're right. Your podcast is the most authentic, real piece of evidence you can get to see what's going on in my room. And yet we all would know that no one would take it seriously because for some reason the podcast just doesn't have that same level of credibility. But that's just simply not the case. How that works into the book is I think by doing the podcast, we knew that certain people who we hadn't interviewed, but we wanted to collaborate with and we had connected via the podcast. This gave another space to interact on that level. And I think for us, as our learning was growing through the podcast, these were areas where we had seen great growth within ourselves. We basically have three sort of pillars. The anti-racism pillar, where we bring in Rukia Mohammed, Gail Bodeau, Dr. Dwayne Brown. Then we have our sort of reading component, and then we have our assessment component. And of course, there's many other pillars to education. But as middle school teachers and as our own growth through the podcast, we said, these are pillars that one we feel that we can grow a little bit more and we could grow a little bit more if we just sort of went away from the podcast space and sort of took a little bit more time because you create a podcast episode, even when really researched, still somewhat limited when you're producing tons of episodes. But the book per se was a five-year project for us. It was a lot of time to read and explore and edit and iterate. And so the the book fits nicely, complements a podcast, but it's, it's very much designed, Pat, like you said, it's like a podcast. We've interviewed people, but not just questions and write back responses. We had the interview. So we could attest to when if you get the transcript, you don't know who the what the person was emphasizing, what their key terms were, what they wanted. They, you read the body language. You read the tone. You know they may have said all of this, but these are the things that you could just tell by the conversation what was important. And we were able to extract that and build on that within the chapter. So I think there's real value that our interviews weren't just sent them an email, answer three questions and give them back to us. We actually conducted the 35, 40 minute interview, took our jot notes, weaved in some of those transcripts, put in some of the sort of the academic research that went along with their academic expertise and then inserted our anecdotes throughout the chapter to say, yes, this is all the academia. These are all the reasons why. And this is what it could look like. So you can come away with every chapter with the academic component, with the research component, and then takeaways that you can quickly take. And as what we've had our original feedback is that each chapter, like if you used it with a staff, you could give a staff a chapter, they could break it down because our anecdotes become like case studies. And each chapter becomes its own little uh, component or sort of mini unit you can use. And we're really we're really proud of it. It is tough work. It was five years of behind the scenes and iteration and editing and iteration and editing and crying and anger and not thinking you can do it. And then you get to the end and, you know, behind the scenes for the 250 pages, there's probably 150 pages and chapters we wrote that just, just got cut. There just, there wasn't room for it or we didn't have time to, to flush it out. So Kwame, thank you for highlighting this space for us and giving us a few moments to talk about our book as I speed talk. And this is why they call me the hurricane and I'll slow it down. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, now, Che, uh, first off, as someone who just finished writing a book and is now in the production stage, I can attest to everything that you and Pav are saying about the process. It is a physically and emotionally and mentally taxing and tedious process, I might add. So many bumps along the road that you hit. But when you get to that finish line, it is the most liberating feeling. And I know when y'all were able to get the box of author copies. It was like, 
as soon as you open it up. But I, I, I want to point, I want to um, talk about something you mentioned, Che. You, you talked about how podcasts aren't viewed in the same way as, let's say, academic publications. But it looks like, at least from my perspective, that podcasts and many other digital media resources are challenging the way that we view scholarship. And it's happening in the academia space. Like there are a lot of professors now who are challenging uh, their department head about what's considered a peer reviewed article, uh, that public scholarship should be part of the process in order to get tenure at the university. So I think in a way people are now starting to shift their views about podcasts, even though it's not the traditional um, academic content that people are accustomed to reading or seeing, it still contributes to the space of scholarship because you are gaining some. I mean, I've, I've brought on so many professors on my own podcast and they've been able to provide that that lens for us who are not in that space. So I think both can uh, contribute collaboratively in this space. I just want to add that real quick. I Oh, I agree with you. I agree in the sense that it's changing, but I also, and I think of Pavanai's journey, I also know that, or I feel comfortable that three or four years ago, like no one took you seriously because you had a podcast, but I, I agree that it's changing and I want to agree that it's changing because even when I think about my own teaching pedagogy, I'm always constantly breaking down the, uh, and Pav, you, you and I both have talked about this and worked it extensively, this hierarchy of literacy that is just underneath the surface. And we always talk about breaking it down or honoring oral as much as we writing, but our documentation, our marking, our curriculum expectations, they never do that. In fact, and, and then when you see something like a podcast versus a book, you see that, you know, as a not not gaslighting any principle or anything like that, but the the amount of credibility that just instinctively goes with this versus the credibility behind the podcast. I've just seen, there's just, there's like that hesitation, like our principal, not our principal. Well, he likes our podcast, but I don't think he thinks of it as, as credibility. But when you, when he sees the book, he's that's credibility. And I and think it's, it's just ingrained underneath. So yes, I believe you and I want to continue to believe you. And I want to keep believing that this audio content does revolutionize the way we perceive people's level of intelligence that this oral content is just as valuable as the written content it's slightly different because you call me you know as you write it goes back and it's edited and it's edited and it's edited and it's iterated over again when we have these rich conversations perhaps the real value in it or the real power in it is it's not edited this is how i'm thinking right at the moment and the back and forth dialogue will further our learning so i just so yes yeah, long answer to say i agree with you and i want to continue to see that and, and I definitely want to see the continuation of that breaking down of this hierarchy of literacy that we constantly, I think a lot of people just have instinctively ingrained to value the written piece over the oral piece. I think that um, culturally, just to piggyback off of what Che is saying, is uh, that we traditionally have not really disrupted that, that literacy space as much. I think that what we're seeing is like a trickling up of, mm -hmm. of this the decolonization of, of educational practice, practices. Um, the written word has always had more hierarchy. It's always been viewed as more important, but we're now starting to get more into, you know, honoring or, oral storytelling in education. And I think that that's, it has started at the elementary level because we're not seeing it as much in high school or in, in higher education yet, but but it's starting to trickle its way up. And, and I think Kwame, just to piggyback on what you were saying as well, we are seeing it more as academic scholarship now because it is starting to, to get to those people who, you know, who are, who are creating these hierarchies in the first place to say that, you know, we should be honoring the oral storytelling piece a little bit more. Um, what Che and I do is very authentic. When, when we tell our stories together, it's very in the moment, it's not scripted, but there are a lot of very um, scripted scholarly conversations that are happening that, you know, go through a, a huge vetting process, just like peer reviewed articles um, and before they are published. And that, that should just be as, at, that should be just as valuable as those peer reviewed articles are because it's going through that huge vetting process as well. So. I'm I'm happy to see that disruption happening. Um, I hope that more people begin to disrupt that in their own, uh, even in their classroom space, 
and start to see that value. And, and you know, Che mentioned uh, administration and them kind of not really truly recognizing it. I think that it just takes a long period of time um, to disrupt it and to and to really recognize it for what it's worth. And, and hopefully we see a lot more of that oral storytelling uh, in the future as well. Yeah, uh, I hope that's the case because we do need, need to disrupt it. And I appreciate you for mentioning how we focus so much on the written word. Um, I actually had Dr. Tim Okun maybe a couple years ago and we really were breaking down a lot of these white supremacy characteristics and how they just show up in all different facets um, of our um, education process. So yeah, I agree. And then we talk so much about differentiation. We talk about uh, UDL, but yet we don't assign the same value to podcasts as we do to these other forms of, of media, but people learn in different ways. So why would you not embrace a, a podcast for students who may be more on the auditory side, more on the visual side, if you you know, want the visuals of it. So I don't know. That's another conversation for another day. Che and Pat, thank you all for coming on. Uh, this has just been an awesome hour. Uh, wish we had more time. We might have to do a part two uh, to really keep this conversation going. But I do want to give you all an opportunity to just share with people how they can connect with you on social media, how they can connect with the podcast, how they can get a copy of amplifying uh, your practice, just everything Che and Pav. So floor is yours. Everything Che and Pav sounds uh, just about right. You can <laughs> reach us on uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and it's at Che and Pav uh, as the handle in all of those spaces. Please reach out to us. Visit chainpav.com. We have everything that we're working on uh, up on our website. We have links to the book. The book can be found on Amazon um, in US and in Canada. So it's uh, easily accessible and uh, it's available for, for you there. Uh, we also have, oh, what did I do? Um, we didn't really talk about the storybook, but Magnificent Microphone is a book that Che and I wrote um, to bring to talk about oral storytelling in, in the classroom space to sort of uh, have that discussion about what oral storytelling could potentially mean for students and the importance of it. Um, and so that was a book that we wrote to introduce podcasting to students. So that's available as well. Um, please, at any point, please reach out to us, info at chainpap.com or on social media, and we're more than happy to connect and talk a little bit more about um, these resources plus the other resources that we offer as well. Che, please fill in those gaps as you do. Chainpav.com for everything Chainpav. But Kwame, uh, thank you for gifting us time to share our story and share our business and speak on the work we've done with such praise. We really appreciate that. Part two will continue uh, when you come on our podcast and we'll do part two of this conversation and we'll highlight your book when it is out and done. So I think that sounds like a great place to continue this conversation. So chainpad.com for that stuff. But thank you so much for just gifting us an hour of your time to just talk teaching and to amplify our work. We're, we appreciate that. We're humbled and we know that you gifted that to us. So thank you very much and for all the great work you're doing in your space right here with Identity Talk. Thank you so much, Che and Pav. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's an honor and continue to do what you all are doing. You all are really breaking some barriers uh, for educators. And like you said, we're doing this together. Uh, this is not a competitive space. I don't view it that way. I know that you all don't view it that way. This is a space where when you all are winning, I'm winning. Everybody is winning. And if we all can embrace that type of attitude, we're only gonna elevate the nature of education and take it to higher places. So I'm gonna just end it with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said, Kwame. Perfect you. ending. Perfect ending. Curtain call. <laughs> and on that note, uh, thank you all and I wish you all a good rest of the day. All right. All right, y'all. So we're about to end another episode of Identity Talk Educators Live. And as always, wish you all good morning, good afternoon, and good night wherever you are in the world. We're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody.